Feeling tired, low mood, short of breath, tingling in hands and feet, difficulty sleeping or concentrating? We may not be getting enough of the vitamin coined nature's most beautiful cofactor. Keep listening on to hear more only here on the People Scientist Podcast. Listening to the People Scientist, the podcast dedicated to helping us optimize our health with the latest scientific findings on neuroscience, physiology, and nutrition. I, your host, Dr. Stephanie Caligiuri, a nutritionist, physiologist, and neuroscientist, will be here with you every single week, bringing us information to ignite our thinking to help us be one step closer to the healthiest we can be. Guess who's back? Back again. The vitamin mini series. <laughs> For some reason, I love singing that song. I don't know why. But today, I'm bringing back the vitamin mini series. Welcome, my People Scientist Army, to the People Scientist Podcast, where every week I arm us with some scientific evidence so we can all lead the healthy lives we want to live. Today, I'm completing the B vitamins in today's episode and going to cover some scientific evidence on what was coined nature's most beautiful cofactor, and that is vitamin B12, otherwise called cobalamin. So far in the vitamin mini-series, I have covered vitamin C, thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, which I personally think was the most interesting vitamin so far, as well as pantothenic acid, vitamin B6, folate, and now vitamin B12. Still to this day, it shocks me that it was not that long ago that thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people died due to vitamin deficiencies because scientists were only just discovering the existence of vitamins in the early to mid 1900s. Today vitamins are so accessible to us and it makes me grateful for all the research that the scientists did several decades ago so that we may live long healthy lives. And it makes me think what we don't know today that we're going to find out several decades in the future and think how crazy it was that we didn't realize that we needed it in our diet to stay healthy. But vitamin B12, like many other vitamins I've covered, also has a rich history in regard to its discovery and important role in our energy, our blood cell health, our neurological health, and more. So without further delay, as we always do, let's start off with some core takeaways. On average, 15% of us are vitamin B12 deficient, and the risk for deficiency goes up tremendously for those following a vegan or vegetarian diet. The reason being, vitamin B12 is found naturally in animal-based foods. Individuals who take medications like metformin, antacids, proton pump inhibitors for excess stomach acid, or those who have undergone surgical removal of part or all of the stomach are at a higher risk for vitamin B12 deficiency. Vitamin B12 is very important for our energy levels, our heart health, our mental health, and memory. If people were found to be deficient, correcting their B12 deficiency with B12 supplements or B12-rich food often improved measures of these conditions. There is no tolerable upper intake level set for vitamin B12, so that means there is no known unsafe high level. Vitamin B12 is very high in foods like clams, trout, salmon, beef, and is adequate in eggs and cheese. Fortified foods like nutritional yeast, fortified cereal, and fortified plant milk may be good sources for individuals eating plant-based. Now, let's get into those details. I always like to start out with the history of the vitamin. I find that so interesting. Signs of what we now know to be vitamin B12 deficiency were documented back in the mid-1800s. Thomas Addison in 1855 described how several patients had similar symptoms, that their appetites failed over periods of months, that they had low mood and low energy levels, and their body had a general waxy appearance. I thought that was interesting that he described their bodies as looking waxy. 
He noted that these symptoms did not respond to typical treatment, and eventually, sadly, the patients passed away. The reason why the skin may have looked waxy is because a B12 deficiency may lead to jaundice or yellowing of the skin. Then we come to the 1900s and vitamin B12 deficiency was noted in individuals that consumed plant-based foods with no animal products. This was when pernicious anemia, a condition that can occur from vitamin B12 deficiency, was coined. Pernicious anemia means that we don't have enough healthy red blood cells to carry away carbon dioxide or to carry oxygen and nutrients to our cells. So symptoms of pernicious anemia include fatigue, shortness of breath, yellowing of the skin, feeling dizzy, having cold hands and feet, and depression. Back then in the mid-1900s, unfortunately, people passed away quite frequently from pernicious anemia because the physicians did not know how to treat it. When they did autopsies on the patients, it often showed that they had degeneration of their nervous system and often the stomach as well. Eventually, scientists realized that liver or liver extract from animals was able to help the patients with pernicious anemia in many of the cases, as liver tends to be very rich in many vitamins and minerals. So that was one of the frequent treatments of pernicious anemia in the early to mid-1900s was to provide liver or liver extract. So today, pernicious anemia is less common to occur as we are just more educated and have more access to vitamins in general. So today, what role does vitamin B12 play for our health? Well, I found when going through university studying nutrition that if I understood the absorption and function of the vitamin, then I could understand who was at risk for deficiency and what symptoms the deficiency would result in. So I want to share with all of you that same logic that I enjoyed. So I'm going to very briefly take us through how vitamin B12 is absorbed. Absorption of vitamin B12 requires quite a few different factors and actually is with the most complex absorption system. First, vitamin B12 is bound to protein in our food because it comes from animal-based foods. So when the food, protein, vitamin B12 complex enters our stomach, we need our stomach acid to cleave the protein from the vitamin B12 to free it, essentially. So you can imagine if people do not have adequate stomach acid, like in the scenario of taking a lot of antacids, or if they take medications to reduce stomach acid like proton pump inhibitors, or if individuals have had part or all of their stomach surgically removed due to cancer or having a gastric bypass for weight loss, then we can imagine that there can be issues with vitamin B12 absorption. The next step in vitamin B12 absorption is once the B12 is freed from the protein by the acid in our stomach, then it has to bind to haptocorin or transcobalamin 1, and then travels to our intestine. Here in our small intestine, vitamin B12 binds to a protein called intrinsic factor. Now, intrinsic factor is made by our stomach. So again, if individuals have issues with the health of their stomach, this could greatly hinder vitamin B12 absorption. In fact, in pernicious anemia, some individuals were actually found to have autoimmune conditions in which their immune system would attack the protein intrinsic factor and actually degrade it. In this scenario, people are very likely to have severe vitamin B12 deficiency. The reason being is they simply just don't have the factors to absorb it. Unfortunately, with age, a lot of trials also show that it appears we are also less able to produce adequate levels of intrinsic factor. So this is in part why the elderly, or people older than 55, tend to be more at risk for B12 deficiency. So after vitamin B12 binds to intrinsic factor in our small intestine, it will cross the intestinal cells and enter our blood circulation where it is brought to the various organs and tissues in our body. Primarily, it is stored in our liver. Our liver is actually the largest storage site for vitamin B12. So you can imagine then if someone has severe liver disease, or had to have a large section of their liver removed for cancer or another ailment, then again, they may be at risk for vitamin B12 deficiency because that storage site has been removed or compromised. Now next, in order to understand the symptoms of a vitamin B12 deficiency, we can recognize the function that B12 plays in our body. Vitamin B12 is involved in the formation of our blood cells, the metabolism of fats and amino acids like homocysteine, As well, it is very important in the formation of myelin, 
Now, myelin creates that protective sheath around our nerve cells, which is really important for the functioning of our nervous system. So as one would think, a vitamin B12 deficiency would disrupt the health of our blood cells, as I mentioned before, potentially resulting in anemia, which in itself carries a lot of symptoms with it. A B12 deficiency may impact our metabolism and heart health because of the impact on homocysteine. And as a result, it could also impact our nervous system and could potentially increase the risk for neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, or multiple sclerosis. As such, the typical signs of B12 deficiency are an increased risk of heart disease, feeling tired, having a headache, feeling irritable, feelings of depression, signs of dementia such as slow ability to think, make decisions, or impaired memory, difficulty sleeping, tingling of the hands and feet, impaired reflexes, restless leg syndrome, a swollen or painful tongue, and weakness. If a B12 deficiency has progressed over a long period of time, it can cause degeneration of components within the nervous system, specifically that myelin sheath, and this can lead to difficulties in walking or movement of the hands and limbs, and even paralysis of the limbs as well. As such, declining levels of vitamin B12 in the blood have been noted in individuals with neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and multiple sclerosis. Vitamin B12 deficiency may also lead to another type of anemia, and that is macrocytic anemia. This means that the red blood cells are larger than normal and are not able to divide. And this can explain the symptoms of us feeling tired, as healthy and adequate numbers of red blood cells are needed to carry oxygen toward our tissues, carbon dioxide away to be exhaled out, and red blood cells are needed to bring nutrients to our organs for energy. Now, whether or not we have macrocytic anemia can be detected with a simple blood test. Have you ever seen MCV, or mean corpuscular volume, on your blood test? This tests the size of the red blood cells, and if the reading is greater than 100, macrocytic anemia may be present. Vitamin B12 levels in the blood may also be tested, and levels above 300 picograms per milliliter indicate adequate vitamin B12 levels. Vitamin B12 deficiency typically develops over the course of years, as total body stores are large, approximately 3 to 5 milligrams, which in many cases is sufficient to provide adequate levels of vitamin B12 for maybe up to 5 to 10 years, it's thought. However, in infants born to vitamin B12 deficient mothers, there may not be any stores established and the infant may be born deficient. And this seems to be particularly more common in mothers that eat vegetarian or vegan based diets that do not take a B12 supplement. Some medications can also reduce our vitamin B12 levels, which is really important to keep in mind. For example, Chapman in 2016 combined together several clinical trials and concluded that the diabetes medication metformin tends to be associated with low levels of vitamin B12. It is thought that this medication may increase the use of vitamin B12 in our body. So if we are taking the medication metformin, it is a very good idea to increase our intake of vitamin B12 and to look at some high food sources of B12. Another drug, nitrous oxide, which is laughing gas, is common, which is commonly used in dentistry or surgery, can cause the rapid depletion of vitamin B12. So if you by chance undergo use of nitrous oxide regularly for procedures, perhaps consider adding some vitamin B12-rich foods into your diet before and after the procedure. And as I mentioned earlier, use of antacids or proton, pumps and, proton pump inhibitors that reduce stomach acid also seem to prevent proper absorption of vitamin B12 and tend to be associated with lower vitamin B12 levels in the blood of individuals. Another group of individuals that may be at risk for B12 deficiency include those who follow a vegetarian or vegan diet, as I mentioned. The reason being is because B12 is found dominantly in animal products. So if we eliminate these from our diet, then we are also eliminating the primary source of vitamin B12. However, in the last few decades, food producers have increased access to B12-fortified foods like nutritional yeast, fortified cereals, fortified plant milks, and more. So can increasing vitamin B12 intake, either through food or supplements, help with any of the conditions or symptoms that I mentioned that were associated with B12 deficiency? Well, due to the role of vitamin B12 in energy metabolism, can this vitamin promote our energy levels? 
supplementation of vitamin B12 on average of 400 micrograms per day may reduce anemia and improve energy levels. Just last year in the Frontiers of Pharmacology journal, a nasal spray of vitamin B12 improved physical functioning and reduced scores of fatigue in those with chronic fatigue syndrome. Specifically, the nasal sprays increased their blood vitamin B12 levels by more than threefold. This resulted in improvement in their physical activity score by 20%, their fatigue levels improved by 4%, and the number of steps they could take walking improved by 22%. So if we are feeling very tired, it is possible that our levels of vitamin B12 may be suboptimal. An intake of B12 might help some measures of fatigue. It was interesting that in this study they gave a nasal spray, which would bypass the gastrointestinal tract. So if anyone has issues absorbing vitamin B12 because of issues with the stomach or the intestines, a nasal spray would bypass that limiting factor because it would absorb into our bloodstream through the nasal passages. However, vitamin B12 supplementation appears to have no beneficial effect on athletic performance if the individuals have adequate vitamin B12 levels. For example, young men with no B12 deficiency were provided 50 micrograms per day of vitamin B12 and had no improvement in the half-mile run or Harvard step test scores after seven weeks as compared with the non-supplemented control group. How about for sleep? Can vitamin B12 promote sleep quality? There are some case reports and animal studies that suggest yes, B12 supplementation can improve circadian rhythm and sleep quality. For example, in 1991, 3 milligrams of methylcobalamin, the natural active form of vitamin B12, improved measures of sleep in two young people with sleep-wake schedule disorders. In 1990, a young woman and a middle-aged man had benefits for their sleep quality with 1.5 milligrams per day. Even though these individuals did not have a B12 deficiency, they benefited from the high-dose B12. But a randomized controlled trial of 50 patients found no benefit for that dose of 3 mg of vitamin B12 per day. So I think the verdict on whether or not B12 can improve sleep quality is still out. But if you suffer from insomnia or another sleep disorder, talking to your physician about high-dose vitamin B12 may be an option. Next, let's look at heart disease. I've spoken before in other episodes, such as in the folic acid folate episode, that homocysteine is an amino acid that circulates in our body, and homocysteine is associated with a higher risk for heart disease, heart attack, and stroke. Evidence from observational studies links elevated homocysteine with coronary heart disease and stroke. That is because homocysteine is thought to increase the processes that induce clogging of the arteries, or atherosclerosis. In the presence of vitamin B12 deficiency, homocysteine levels rise. And that is because vitamin B12 is important for the metabolism of homocysteine. Results from several clinical trials indicate that combining vitamin B12 with folic acid supplements can significantly decrease homocysteine levels in people with vascular disease or diabetes. However, the more important clinical trials looking at the hard endpoints of lifespan or incidence of heart attack or stroke with vitamin B12 supplementation are not very clear. But the hope is that if we reduce the homocysteine levels with adequate vitamin B12, that we can reduce our risk of heart disease, heart attack, and stroke, as homocysteine is very strongly linked with the incidence of these events. If B12 deficiency can lead to negative effects on cognition, can B12 supplements improve measures of dementia, memory, or decision-making, or thinking? It appears that short-term supplementation of vitamin B12 may not improve measures of cognition. In 2018, a meta-analysis concluded that there is no evidence for beneficial effects on cognition of supplementation with B vitamins for 6 to 24 months. However, there was evidence from one clinical study that illustrated that vitamin B12 supplementation reduced brain atrophy, which is shrinking of the brain, which happens with age. There was also a beneficial effect of B vitamins on short-term memory in those with higher homocysteine levels. So B vitamins in general or vitamin B12 may have some benefit against dementia. Likely, I think in my personal opinion, that the B vitamins and vitamin B12 have a preventative action. 
as vitamin B12 is necessary for proper health and functioning of our nervous system. And if we have a vitamin B12 deficiency and our nervous system becomes damaged, I don't think vitamin B12 can reverse that damage, but I think it can certainly prevent that damage. So vitamin B12 may slow or prevent the onset or progression of neurodegenerative diseases, in my opinion. Now, how about for our mood or mental health? Since vitamin B12 deficiency seems to be hallmarked by poor mood, can B12 supplementation improve mood? In 2015, Almeida and colleagues concluded after combining 11 randomized controlled trials that use of vitamins in the long term may have benefit against depression. They noted that if vitamins were taken for days to a few weeks, that no benefit was noted in those taking antidepressant medications. However, however, several weeks to years of taking vitamins may decrease the risk of relapse and may also decrease the onset of significant depressive symptoms in people at risk for depression. So again, this speaks to the fact that nutrition and vitamins, and vitamin B12 in particular, may be more important and more effective in prevention or preventing the progression of a disease, and that the positive effects may take time, therefore, to be seen. They're not necessarily super effective for treatment of certain conditions, but for the prevention of them. Firth in 2018 combined 18 clinical trials that included 832 patients living with schizophrenia. Vitamin B supplementation, which included vitamin B6 and vitamin B12, reduced the risk of psychiatric symptoms significantly versus the control group. These benefits were seen at doses of 400 micrograms of vitamin B12 per day. So it appears that vitamin B12 may benefit mental health in schizophrenia. So let's talk about how we can consume vitamin B12. For anyone 14 years of age and older, the recommended amount of B12 to get minimum every day is 2.4 micrograms. Now the highest source of natural vitamin B12 includes clams. Three ounces of cooked clams gives 3,500% the daily recommended amount. That's huge. Three ounces of beef liver gives nearly the same. So clams and beef liver are extremely high in vitamin B12. Rainbow trout, sockeye salmon, and light tuna are also great sources, where three ounces of these fish give 100-200% to the daily value of vitamin B12. Vegetarians happen to eat cheese or eggs. These are also good sources, as one ounce of Swiss cheese gives nearly 40% of the daily amount, and one egg gives 25% the daily amount. Plant-based sources include nutritional yeast, where one tablespoon can give 40% the daily amount. One serving of fortified breakfast cereal may give 25% depending on the cereal. And one cup of fortified almond milk may provide 50% of the vitamin B12 requirement. And you can find out that information by simply looking at the nutrition label. If it has vitamin B12 fortified, often they'll also indicate on the label how much of the daily requirement that it fulfills for vitamin B12. Now besides food, let's talk about supplements. Vitamin B12 in supplements can be bound to a methyl group or a cyanide group. Now when I heard that it was bound to cyanide, that shocked me a bit. A cyanide is seen as a harmful poisonous compound. In fact, for people that have cyanide poisoning, poisoning, a common treatment is to actually give unbound vitamin B12 because vitamin B12 binds very readily to cyanide. But the amount of cyanide present in supplements is very, very low. In fact, natural cyanide is present in very small quantities in some foods, like almonds and pits of some fruit like cherry pits. But hopefully no one eats the pits of cherries or fruits anyway. One study noted that in individuals with kidney impairment, that cyanocobalamin, which is vitamin B12 bound to cyanide, may have had some toxic effects because their kidneys may not be able to filter out the cyanide. So it may be best to choose the other form of supplemental vitamin B12 methylcobalamin, which is the natural form found in our food. Another thing to consider if we are having difficulty absorbing vitamin B12, if we have stomach issues or an autoimmune condition that targets the intrinsic factor necessary to absorb B12, then oral supplements may not help too much. For example, only about 10 micrograms of a 500 microgram oral supplement is actually absorbed in healthy people. 
As a result, some individuals require an injection of vitamin B12 into, the, into their muscle in order to bypass the stomach absorption and increase B12 more efficiently. Nasal sprays have recently been published as well and may be effective alternatives to the muscle injections. So as I had mentioned earlier, vitamin B12 has one of the most complex systems in order to be absorbed. And as a result, for people that have a severe deficiency of vitamin B12, oral intake of vitamin B12 may not be adequate. And that's when bypassing the digestive gastrointestinal tract is important. And that's when injection or nasal spray is looked at. Another thing I found that was interesting back in 1958 and since then is that it was realized that a vitamin B12 deficiency may cause vitamin C to be used up more readily. So if we are known to have low levels of vitamin B12, then it is suggested to also make triple sure that we are getting enough vitamin C as well. And I covered vitamin C in the very first episode of this vitamin mini-series. Now, can we get too much vitamin B12? The evidence suggests no. There is no tolerable upper intake level set for vitamin B12. This is in contrast to some other vitamins that do have a maximum level that we should not exceed. For example, in the last vitamin mini-series episode for vitamin B6, I spoke at length how too high levels of vitamin B6 can lead to our nerves to deteriorate, causing a lot of neurological issues. But there does not seem to be a maximum level for vitamin B12. Some clinical trials have looked at over 800 times the daily requirement at 2-3 to mg per day and did not note any negative side effects. This is likely due to the fact that only so much vitamin B12 can be absorbed as there are many rate-limiting steps to us being able to absorb that much vitamin B12 anyway. As I mentioned, we need haptocorin or transcobalamin 1 as well as intrinsic factor to just absorb vitamin B12. We only produce so much of those proteins. However, higher blood concentrations of vitamin B12 can be achieved with injections or nasal sprays for people with severe vitamin B12 deficiency. So that is a wrap, my People Scientist Army. In today's episode, I covered some of the scientific evidence on vitamin B12, otherwise called cobalamin. Today, I talked about vitamin B12 and how it is very important for our energy levels, cognition, mental health, and heart health. Correcting a vitamin B12 deficiency appears to improve measures of fatigue, mood, psychiatric symptoms, homocysteine levels, and therefore heart disease risk. If we take the diabetes medication metformin, please consider adding vitamin B12 rich foods to our diet or ask your doctor to check your vitamin B12 levels in your blood. The same goes if we take antacids regularly or proton pump inhibitors. Many of us happen to be at risk for deficiency. In fact, on average, 15% of us have been found to have a a B12 deficiency. And particularly if we eat a vegan or vegetarian diet, that risk goes up tremendously. So it is important for us to take a look at our diet and aim to eat some sources of vitamin B12 regularly, like clams, salmon, trout, cheese, or eggs. If we choose to take a supplement, the evidence suggests that the cyanocobalamin form of vitamin B12 should be safe and able to increase our blood vitamin B12 levels. But if we do have issues with absorption, then we, then we may require muscle injections or nasal spray of vitamin B12. If we happen to have concerns with the cyanocobalamin form that contains or is bound to cyanide, particularly if we have kidney impairment, then we can take a look at the other form of vitamin B12, which is methylcobalamin. So that is it, my people scientist army. I hope you all have a wonderful and safe week. And I look forward to meeting you back here the same time and same place next week on the People Scientist podcast. Bye for now. I am a scientist simply sharing scientific evidence. Some of the clinical interventions I discuss are not appropriate for everyone. Before making any changes to your diet or lifestyle, please do consult the advice of your physician or dietitian. My opinions expressed here do not necessarily reflect those of Mount Sinai Hospital and its affiliates.